Returning to politics now, let's uh, speak to Tony Passon, Liberal MP. Thanks so much for your time. I want to start in your neck of the woods, South Australia, one of the senior figures in the Liberal Party for many years, of course, a quarter of a century in this, in this place has been Christopher Pine. He's gone straight into a job with EY. Is that appropriate to, to go from Defence Minister and then within a couple of months be advising on those matters to one of the big, big firms? Well, Kieran, it's not for me to determine whether that's a breach of the ministerial... Uh, code of conduct. But what I do know is the fact we're talking about it uh, is indicative that it just doesn't pass the pub test. That's my view. Uh, the average punter out there hears about this, knows that there should be a reasonable break between someone, you know, fulfilling the role uh, as minister in a particular portfolio and then being employed in the uh, private sector um, in that same field. Um, you know, it's disappointing um, that it doesn't meet the pub test, but and it doesn't, and um, uh, perhaps that's something we need to reflect on as a parliamentary class about what we do, do going is forward. Is there anything you can do to sort of combat that? Because that does that come down to personal judgment? Is there anything that an inquiry that's been pushed by Centre Alliance might achieve? Do you support an inquiry? Well, these inquiries are ultimately toothless. Um, they will um, shine a light on these issues, but they don't have any teeth in terms of what they can do functionally. Um, my suggestion is that, you know, we really look at this in, in a way through the prism of, you know, what is not necessarily technically correct, but what is in the spirit um, of the code. Um, I come out of the law. Um, conflicts of interest uh, are things that, if there's a perceived conflict of interest, it operates just like any other conflict of the interest. The thing is, as well, it's not just any minister. It's the defence minister. That's quite a highly sensitive role where you'd have access to a lot of confidential information mm. at the highest levels. And so why isn't there a specific protection for that as opposed to other ministers? We know plenty have been caught up with this in the past. Well, that's a very good question for this place going forward. It doesn't operate retrospectively in relation to Mr Pine's case. And I accept that there should perhaps be some more consideration about some specific rules and maybe a bit tighter rules around ministerial code of conduct. But, but I come back to, um, ultimately, this is a question of personal judgment and ministers who leave uh, this place who have been given the great privilege of those officers within the executive should think seriously about uh, whether decisions they make once they leave are in the spirit of the code or, or, or not. And, you know, to put it plainly, whether it passes the a pub test or not. You don't, you don't obviously, you, you think that his uh, judgement has been flawed in this matter by going so quickly into that role. It doesn't pass the pub test in your view, but uh, going to Annalise's point, are there, are you worried about the, the, the security, the national security elements of this, given only a couple of months ago Mr Pine was aware and in decision-making bodies and being briefed by the top military brass and now going to provide behind behind closed doors advice to one of the big firms well, with a big, you know, well, Kieran, book I'm, in this area of defence. Kieran, I'm not worried about those things because ultimately I respect Mr Pine's judgement and he'll make sure that he meets the standard specifically. I, I'm making more an observation. But you don't respect his judgement in this case going into that job. No, it's, it don't, it's yeah. not one that I would have made. But I'm certain that he'll meet his specific requirements and, and technically it will ensure, as... as as someone who is aware of these issues, that he doesn't breach the ministerial code. I just think it's something that we should consider more broadly um, going forward because it doesn't reflect well on the political class. Um, and if, uh, to pick up Annalise's point, it's something that our parliament might need to think about going forward. But um, right now, I just think it's the fact we're talking about it is, is because the, the average punter out there doesn't think it passes the pub test. Now, there's a lot of discussion around press freedoms at the moment. Uh, government and Labor both seem to have different perspectives on how to handle it. Why is uh, this something that can't be handled by the, uh, the PCIG? Well, um, Annalise, I understand the Prime Minister's written today that the Leader of the Opposition. I'm very hopeful, as I understand the Prime Minister is, that ultimately we come to a bipartisan position in relation to this. Um, the uh, PJCIS uh, is, as I understand it, going to embark upon an inquiry around uh, this issue. But we, we need to um, strike the right balance between um, freedom of the press uh, and protection of uh, Australian citizens. This is a devilishly complicated uh, area and it needs to be dealt with delicately. Um, but it would, there would be irony, wouldn't there, if... Because the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security has the capacity to have in-camera evidence mm -hmm. provided. There would be a wonderful irony, wouldn't there, if the AFP decided to provide evidence or the committee accepted that evidence 
privately. Mm. That should be public, shouldn't it? Well, um, Kieran, I'm not about to come onto your program until um, the very good chair of that committee, Andrew Hasty, had to go about uh, his business. That is uh, probably one of the most important joint standing committees, if not the most important joint standing committee uh, in this building. But I come back to... I, I think all of us, um, whether we're in this building uh, performing a, a press role or in this building performing a parliamentary role, were slightly uncomfortable with what we saw in and around the events of what was probably three weeks ago now. I know for sure... I know I, I was someone who texted the journalist involved immediately to say, look, I'm thinking of you because, you know, I've... Um, I'm an ex-criminal lawyer, I've been to plenty of raids, I've never been the subject of any, but I know how stressful uh, that would have been, that, that invasion into her personal space and, and these other things, not to speak of the other um, raids in relation um, to the ABC. But we've got to get this balance right. Um, we need a, a free, transparent um, press, um, and, but we also need to ensure our intelligence agencies, our security uh, authorities can operate in a way that's effective. Now, Kieran's written a column this morning for 2600 about maybe potentially some ongoing animosities among the Cabinet colleagues, uh, in particular for Matthias Cormann going forward. Yeah. Well, the, well one of, I've had a couple of ministers say, uh, reiterate the view that he has been damaged through this whole process and off the back of a, a win like we saw you achieve just a, a couple of months ago, it's interesting to see that those views are being offered quite freely still, and also that Peter Dutton has been diminished by the whole process. Are you frustrated that that is still something that's being shared quite uh, quite freely right now? Well, Kieran, I enjoyed your piece, particularly insights in relation to um, your time at the G20 and President Trump in particular. But when I got to those uh, comments that, uh, you know, Liberal insiders have provided you, I must say, I was incredibly disappointed and frustrated um, with whoever... Uh, is providing that background uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, on the first hand, um, you know, you're talking about um, two giants of, of the Liberal Party in, in this place. Uh, but on the other... Uh, and secondly, uh, this is um, an occasion where people are, uh, are going back to the bad old days of talking about ourselves. What we don't want is a scenario uh, where we're talking about ourselves because the people in this building don't matter as much as the people outside this building. And if we're talking about ourselves, we're not talking about the people who matter and the people who gave us the great privilege of being here. So the fact that people, uh, and a, a number of people have spoken to you about this is, I think, reflects poorly on them rather than the individuals they were speaking to you about. One of the uh, things that I mentioned in that piece was the, the uh, Hockey-Morrison mm. relationship, and they've been able to bury the hatchet. They haven't always got on that well because, no. of course, there were tensions when Joe Hockey was Treasurer. But now, at that table, Donald Trump on the other side, there was uh, Ambassador Hockey, Prime Minister Morrison, and they've been able to move on. I guess you'd be urging others in your party to do the same thing. Well, I've, I'm urging others in our party to, um, to acknowledge our, our success humbly, um, to get on with uh, what the people of Australia have asked us to do, and Quite frankly, the events of August of last year and how they've played out and whether individual figures are diminished or risen up, I think totally irrelevant to the average punter on Commercial Street, Mount Gambier, or the people I care about. If this isn't just any minister, though, we're talking about the Senate. There's so much focus for the government. This could be make or break for you for key legislation like Medivac. Uh... And at least that's why I've said that, you know, Matthias, Senator Matthias Corbyn is a line in this place for the Liberal Party. One of the best negotiators ever to enter into the Senate. Uh, a great bloke into the bargain, but uh, I'd, I'd, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better operator in this building. So often uh, you find when people want to um, skulk around in the shadows and talk um, down colleagues, uh, there's an agenda driving behind it. Um, I don't know what that is. Uh, if I knew who the individuals were, I might have a better idea. I'm not asking for that. But what I am saying and saying to those individuals, can you just get on with worrying about the people of Australia, not the people who um, sit in the party room with you. Finally, on the, on the tax uh, plan, it looks like the government is going to get that through. Is that something you're, in, you know, pleased about as you go back to your constituents at the end of the week? It, it was the... The government was criticised for not having a, a broad agenda. This was the one big policy, though, that it's hard to deny the government's got a mandate for. I'm happy it passed the House of Representatives. I'm not going to jump the shark here. Um, there's obviously more negotiations uh, to take place in the Senate. I'm hopeful that we'll return 
uh, to the electorate, able, I'll, I'll return to the electorate, able to tell the people of Barker and people of Australia more broadly that they sent us to Canberra to do one job this week, and that was to legislate tax cuts that we took to them uh, faithfully in the election that they supported. Uh, and quite frankly, you know, the Labor Party should get on board and get on board quickly. Tony Passon, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Let's